Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I'm a board-certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete with over 10 years of experience working with teenage and adult athletes of all abilities. Today, longtime sports dietitian and endurance athlete Bob Sibahar returns to the show to talk about fueling teenage athletes. It's been five whole years since I chatted about young athlete nutrition, so it was most definitely time to revisit this very important topic. Bob and I explored some common themes and challenges that we both encounter in this population, including scheduling challenges, peer pressure, the influence of social media, sports team and family dynamics, body image issues, lack of sleep, how puberty impacts nutrition and performance, how nutrient needs differ for teenage athletes compared to adults, developing nutrition knowledge and skills before college, prioritizing cognitive function through nutrition, and so much more. As you can imagine, this is a topic we could have talked about for hours upon hours, but we kept it to one hour and we highlighted the most important points as well as strategies to support teenage athletes as they navigate their changing bodies in busy, busy schedules. So whether you are a current or future parent of a young athlete or you're a young athlete yourself, I hope you find this episode helpful. And just an FYI that I have a free download on my website under the nutrition resources tab called nutrition tips for student athletes. In case you haven't already checked it out, head on over to my website. You can grab that little freebie there. All right. So here is my episode all about nutrition for teenage athletes with sports dietitian, Bob Sibahar. Bob, it's so great to see you again. Welcome back to the Eat for Endurance podcast. How's your day going so far? Oh, it's fantastic. And thanks for having me back. I definitely appreciate this uh, second time coming on. Yeah, totally. Well, before we start chatting about today's topic, which is young athlete nutrition, um, maybe you can just give everyone a quick refresher on yourself as a dietitian and athlete. Oh, quick refresher. So um, let's be as quick as possible. The two-minute version. <laughs> I am a sport dietitian. I, I wear a couple of different hats. So sport dietitian, exercise physiologist, strength and conditioning coach, and endurance coach. Um, yes, I am an athlete myself, more of an endurance athlete, but I like to experiment with different things. So uh, this summer was more like fast packing, if you will. Um, I try to keep it fresh. I do a lot of lifting, a lot of, a lot of different stuff. Yeah, I saw you were training for Tahoe 200 and you were doing your own 200 or something. Yeah, how did, it was, it was like, the Tahoe 200. How'd that all go? <laughs> it was interesting. It was interesting. So yeah, the Tahoe 200 was with an athlete that I coach. Um, oh. And unfortunately, we didn't make a, a check time. So we got uh, oh, okay. pulled from that race. But yeah, I, I tried, you know, I attempted a 200 on my own and I learned a lot. Um, I ended up going 24 hours and covered 73 miles with over 10,000 feet of gain and loss. Uh, wow. So it was it was interesting because, you know, I had some, you know, we get older, Claire, and just things happen to our bodies. Yes. And so I, I actually yes. listened to my body instead of being dumb like I used to be. Uh, so, yeah, I, I cut it a little bit short. And, you know, I figured next time I do that, I think I'm going to have a buddy with me just because it's more fun mm -hmm. with a buddy. And it's just, I don't know, it's more enjoyable, but also just being out there. I mean, I love being out there by myself. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But there's just so much more you can enjoy with someone else and just experience with someone else. Right. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, thanks for filling yeah. me in. Cause I, I, I kind of like seen little glimpses of the 200 stuff. I was like, Oh, I should ask Bob about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Even though it's obviously not relevant to our discussion today, but so thanks right, for bringing me right. there. Um, all right. So I know we have limited time today, so let's just dive right in. We're talking about student athlete nutrition. We're going to focus on the teenage years. So mostly kind of high school, college time. Um, and, you know, like myself, you work with a wide range of active people, like across all age groups. So I'm curious what, you know, from what you've observed, what are some common challenges that you see in this age group? And maybe it's helpful to even break it up into like, you know, early teenage years versus later teenage years, since obviously there's a lot going on in those different time periods. But yeah, why don't we start there? There really is, isn't there? Because you can you can break it up. You can break it up in a couple of different ways. Like you can go like high school, college, or yep. you could go pre-puberty, puberty, and post-puberty, right? Mm -hmm. I I sometimes like talking more about like high school and college first because okay. you're kind of making the assumption that most likely you're at least in the puberty phase, if not post-puberty, right? So the yeah. pre-puberty, sometimes you get in high school, sometimes you don't. But no, to your to your point, I think if we go like high school versus college, and we should factor in the, the pubertal development throughout this conversation, there are some significant challenges, right? So like high school athletes, 
I mean, I feel like they're coming into their new body. So I always refer to that as they're driving a new car, like every couple of years, because mm-hmm. when their body changes, they've got to determine, like, I just talked to this young swimmer every month we talk and he grew like one and a half inches in the past four weeks. And like, you know, put on 10 pounds and you're like, oh, well, how is that affecting? He's a swimmer. How's that affecting you in the water? Like you just like, they have different lengths. They have different mechanics, right? So I feel like high school is a lot different than college. High school also is that time where, you know, they're looking for acceptance. They've got that Mm -hmm. social network. It's a little bit more stressful. They don't really know who they are yet. In addition to that, they're literally going to school for such a long time throughout the day, decreased eating opportunities. They're not shopping for themselves yet. Their parents are trying to have some influence, but you know, high schoolers, like they don't want to listen to their parents, right? So (laughs) I feel like the, the high school athlete has a lot of stuff going on. And not that yeah. college athletes don't, but it's, you know, I always, I always say, I wish, cause I work with a lot of college athletes also. And I always tell them like, man, I just, I wish I could have had this time with you in high school. So we could have shaped some of your behaviors and mm-hmm. it would just make college so much easier in, in terms of nutrition, at least. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think these, like, I mean, as you said, there, there's just so much going on and each grouping has like different challenges. Um, uh, I mean, maybe we can start with the high schoolers or or if you'd like to break it out more into kind of surrounding puberty and how that goes. Like, what do you think the best way to kind of begin this conversation would be? Yeah, you know, I think it, it's funny because we could we could actually um, specify the, the male versus female, number one, that because too. We, mm-hmm. we see the puberty hitting at different times. Right. Yep. And that mm-hmm. sometimes is is a factor. Uh, I mean, you know, I feel like if we just do high school. Um, in general, and then we can kind of kind of yeah. spill over into the different categories. So maybe, I mean, maybe just as a starting point, because um, we are focusing on nutrition, and again, there are all these other things influencing, right? But yes. when we just think about what are the actual nutritional needs of you know high schoolers, let's say, and how are they different from you know the adult population and active people and athletes? Like, what are the real big things that we're kind of thinking about? Yeah, it's a great question because my first statement will be that young athletes are not many adults. They're just yes. not many versions of us. But unfortunately, like I, I meet with a lot of parents too, and, and they just, you know, a lot of the stories come up like, oh, well, this is what I do now. And this is so-and-so. And I'm like, but but that's not where your child is. Like your child is 30, 40, like whoever, whatever age younger, they are very different. So we have to think of this in developmental stages, right? So even even with the puberty stage, like their bodies are still developing, their brains are still developing, they need different sustenance. So usually that means they need a little bit more carbohydrates. Um, they definitely need more protein. And that's, well, I'm sure we'll get to this. One of the major, major challenges that I see with high school athletes is protein. Um, they knew, they knew, do need more fat because of the brain development and fat is extremely important for brain development. However, that's the first that we'll usually give because a lot of high school athletes are like anti-fat, like, oh, no, no, that's that's quote unquote bad. Mm. So overall, I mean, I don't really think of it in calories, but definitely high school athletes do require more nutrients, carbohydrate, protein, especially fat for sure, um, just because of that developing body and brain. And to that point, I feel like a lot of parents and young athletes disregard the brain development and the cognitive development. I think they yeah. always think, physical because that's what you see, right? Oh, my son or daughter is getting taller, whatever it is, right? Or the coach wants this. A lot of times they forget about their work in the classroom. So I just want to emphasize that when we talk about like high school or college athletes, they are student athletes in that order, right? So whenever I work with a high school or college athlete, I'm always looking them as a student first. So how can we use in nutrition to improve your cognitive functioning in the classroom And then, oh, yeah, you are also a high performing athlete at the same time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, And maybe we can just briefly mention also the micronutrients that this population needs, right? So we always think about calcium. Maybe you can speak Mm -hmm. to kind of some other ones. Yeah, calcium for sure. Iron, you know, it's interesting because 
but you know, back in the past, we didn't really focus on iron too much unless it was like mm-hmm. a cross country female or something like that. Right. But I'm actually finding a lot more, not necessarily deficiencies, but lower iron levels, even in male team sports, which is kind mm. of fascinating. It doesn't happen yeah. too often. Um, but I just wanted to put that one out there. Here's another thing though. <laughs> um, we're seeing this and you see this too, but I find some students, student athletes, high school athletes, still kind of experimenting with the whole veganism and plant-based eating. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, we don't have to go down that path, but that will, that could lead to micronutrient deficiencies as you and I know. So specifically your B12, uh, your calcium for sure. Um, Vitamin D is another push that I see that I really try to emphasize. And Unfortunately, we're not going to get vitamin. Well, high school athletes are not going to get vitamin D from a lot of foods because yeah. they're not going to eat those type of foods because they're, they're mm-hmm. I mean, unless they're fortified, but yeah. I find a lot more deficiencies in vitamin D these days mm-hmm. in young athletes. So a lot of high school athletes, unfortunately, don't have their vitamin D tested. And I would highly recommend anybody listening to this right now, if you're a parent or if you're an athlete, um, you know, talk to your parent about having this test done. It's very economical, but it's it's alarming, clear how many college athletes I see in all different sports, both genders, who are vitamin D deficient, like crazy vitamin D deficient. Would so, you say that's like everybody though? I mean, everybody, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I see, I mean, in a lot of my populations, I see like just across the board that uh, number one, it's still not always checked. And number two, a lot of right, people are right. just so low. But yeah, they are. I, I hear yeah, your point. Yep. Yeah, I think that could be a good assumption. Like when in doubt, you're probably low in vitamin D. Um, but you know, and, and we used to say, oh, well, if you're a team, like an indoor sport, chances yeah. of being more vitamin D deficient are higher. But listen, I you know, there's a lot of genetics that goes into this also. But what do we know about high school athletes these days and the propensity for them going outside for repeated time, right? Unless their sport, you know, does that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. unless they're probably cross country or track where they get to spend a lot of time outside in in mm. you know not covered up. But look at football, look at baseball, look at soccer they're wearing a lot of clothing normally, right? Which is blocking mm-hmm. the rays. So yeah, to your point, I think that's, it's a lot more prominent than people think. Yeah. Um, maybe we can talk about, or actually, I mean, I always like to kind of set the stage. And when I think about the kinds of athletes I've worked with, you know, like you're saying, like student than athlete, right? I mean, they're, they're trying to adhere to these like rigorous academic schedules. They're in, they have their training, they have their social life, you know, that they're trying to keep up with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a lot of travel involved. If, you know, you're on a certain team and there's team sports, that kind of stuff or other extracurriculars, you know, sleep, which is, we'll get to in a little bit, you know, sleep is like a whole thing. Um, And on top of that, you know, I found like some of these, just these scheduling things is just so much. And, you know, and then if there are any kind of, I want to, I don't want to call it, we'll call it selective eating, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. not, and not, they don't eat everything, you know, so parents, I, I'm sure there are more parents listening to this than the athletes themselves, you know, parents can get very, you know, just frustrated. Maybe they're not being listened to, or maybe they're just like, oh, I'm trying to get my child to do all these things. Um, you know, so there's just, there's just a lot going on. Um, and maybe, again, I know it'll depend on the individual, but what are some kind of common nutrition recommendations or strategies and maybe like just maybe examples, like things that you find yourself saying over and over again to these types of clients who are kind of juggling lots of things. Um, I don't know, but, you know, just, yeah. just trying to kind of explore this stuff and we can get more specific, but again, I'm just, I'm kind of interested in kind of themes right now and just like the yeah. most frequent things we see and then we'll kind of get a little more granular about it. But right, yeah, right. what are your kind of, what are the first things you think about when I say that? Well, the first, let me just set some qualifiers for, to start with one high school athletes are overscheduled and undernourished. And I can say yes. that with 100% confidence. The second thing I want to say to the parents out there, your kids will not listen to you when you try to talk to them about nutrition. And I say that with 100% confidence because as we all know, I am a sport dietitian. I've got three kids who are now past the high school age. They uh, think about having a sport dietitian as a resource in your house living with you, right? And the kids don't listen to you. Like that, I'm sorry, it just happens. Parents, 
I feel you. It just happens, right? They don't start yeah. listening to you until they get out of the house. Trust me on this one. Okay. So that said, I think the, you know, the commonality really, once we kind of get it, this high school athlete, like the, what, what we're really talking about is, and, and you, you know me, you know how I work with like my mm-hmm. whole thing is metabolic efficiency training, right? It's controlling and optimizing blood sugar through using different foods, right? Carbohydrate, protein, fat. Young athletes, high school athletes are very vulnerable to blood sugar changes very quickly, much quicker than adults. Like their blood sugar, which you can pretty much relate to your your st- your energy throughout the day, it goes up and down extremely fast. So think about a roller coaster, right? A high school athlete's blood sugar, it's going to go up and down on a roller coaster probably every two hours, right? Whereas adults, it's usually three to four hours. So the first thing I see is really that they are having a tough time nourishing their body. But when we talk about nourishing, it's really about optimizing their blood sugar because that has an, that's like the 20,000 foot view, right? Yeah. If we can put food together to, to optimize their blood sugar, they have brain energy. They can actually focus in class minus the whole sleep thing, which again, you said, we'll talk later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're paying attention. They can actually make it through their day to afternoon practices. So I feel like that is like the concept that needs to be really hit home with a lot of high school athletes. It's not just like, oh, hey, have a snack here and there. It's like, let's look at it first about how this food is reacting to and for your brain and your body, but more importantly, how does it actually create energy and steady your energy throughout the day? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. no, for sure. And, and one of the things that, I mean, we can talk about caffeine more in a bit, but like, you know, I think about energy drinks and, Mm. you know, just all this all these drinks yes. that are really just have no place in you yep. know, this population or things yep. like prime or, you know, just all these really yeah. popular trendy things that are just like doing nothing. And if, I mean, they're harmful in many cases, right. I mean, they I think are. about like yeah. the vitamin A levels and, you know, in prime or, you know, obviously excessive caffeine intake is extre- extremely harmful, not recommended, especially if you're under 18. Um, but, you know, thinking about just like all of these kind of, more, I don't want to say more basic, but they are kind of more foundational, basic yeah. things that we can think about in terms of hydration and getting, you know, actual food in your body and consistent eating and all these things that actually help you with energy um, versus, you know, these, you know, often very busy, stressed out kids who are just trying yeah. to make it through all the stuff they have to do and thinking about college and just all the pressures that are put on them, um, you know, and, yeah, so there's there's a lot to think about there. And I know with the clients I've worked with, you know, just having ac- regular access to food that, um, you know, where you're not like, because I see kids that are just like, oh, well, I had to rush off to class or this teacher won't let me eat in class or, you know, oh, I didn't have anything available or the school only had like, like they only had potato chips. So I just had three bags of potato chips because I hadn't eaten for six hours. You know, it's like you yep. see stuff like that. Um so, so yeah, I think there's a lot of just like we do with the adult population as well, who are busy with, they're busy with work and they're juggling other things, you know, we're trying to think in advance, okay, like what kinds of snacks can you pack? What can you bring from home? What's available at school? Is your, like, if you're in a team sport environment, is the coach, you know, supportive of, you know, eating and drinking and taking breaks and, you know, are they supportive of feeling? Because as you know, like I sort of yeah. worked with, I mean, I'm just thinking about swimming in particular. I've worked with many competitive swimmers where they weren't getting water breaks or fueling breaks or anything. And they were right. real, like, they needed those. So, you know, there, again, there's lots of things to think about when approaching this, this population. <laughs> yeah, there really are. And, you know, if it, this is how, how I'll intro this and refer to it as, so, so kids at this age, athletes at this age, it's, this is my analogy. They want to drive the car, but they don't know how to drive yet. Okay. So what I mean here is they, they want to skip all the steps of learning how to drive and literally just get in the car and start driving. It's the same thing with nutrition. So they want to skip all the steps and just have the bag of chips or, and that's, that's not, it's not that they want the bag of chips. It's that they haven't learned the skills to prepare and be proactive to be able to pack something else, to be able to say, oh, I'm going to be at school from 7.30 to 2.30 or 3.30. What am I going to need to do? And here's the thing. 
high school athletes do not have critical thinking skills developed yet, right? That's part of this whole education process, also part of parents' uh, process, but we need to help them with that, right? So instead of, because I hear this all the time, well, I just didn't have time. You actually did have time, but you don't have the skills to know mm -hmm. what to do when you don't have time, right? So I feel like that's the bottom line is like these, these young athletes need to have these skills developed. And it's not just about parents saying, eat breakfast. I mean, what, when you hear that, we know what that means. Well, some of us know as, as adults, but, but a young athlete will be like, okay, pop tart it is, or bagel it is like, because they don't think through it, right? They don't think long-term or eight hours ahead. So I yeah. feel like those are the skills that are missing in the education that young athletes are actually receiving these days. It's being, they're being much more reactive than proactive in their nutrition. Yeah. And then there's also the piece of just, sometimes we get, you know, kids who are a little resistant to things. So, you know, I certainly, I don't know if this has ever happened to you before. And now I know to like ask the right questions to make sure this doesn't happen anymore, but I've had parents who really want their competitive athlete child to work with me and guess what? Who doesn't want to work with me? The yep. actual person, you know, like, exactly. like you know, exactly. they don't want to, you know, they don't want to work with me. Like, and there's, and you know, and when we talk about family dynamics, um, you know, that's like a whole other layer of complexity where, oh, yeah. you know, the baggage of the parent, and all the things that get shoved under the kid. And I mean, yes. and sometimes parents are so well-intentioned and sometimes there's just some really like not great role modeling going on. Um, right. or, or thinking that, oh, well, I'm doing a low carb diet. You should too. You know, there's right, lots, there's just right. so much stuff happening and swirling around there. Um, the other yeah. thing I think about is, um, you know, kids who sometimes like, I'll be like, okay, cool. Like, let's bring this snack and Hey, we need to keep it cold. Can you bring a cooler back? They're like, I'm not bringing a cooler. Bag. I know, like, that's, I know. I'm not doing that. Like, that's I'm not, not cool. Be that person. I'm not going to be that person. I mean, I even get adults resisting this sometimes. Like I'm not doing that. I'm like, totally. dude, come on. Um, so, you know, so again, it's, it's, it's so much more complicated than us just being like, Hey, here are these great nutrition, nutrition recommendations all laid out for you, individualized to you. Here you go. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. just not that simple. No. Um, so I think, I mean, what was my goal today? I, I mean, I guess I didn't sit up to have, a, I, I want to just have a conversation, but maybe yeah. the, the better conversation to have rather than just be like, like, yes, it might, it might be very helpful to, especially if any parents are listening, it might be helpful to hear about, oh, here are some ideas or whatever, but even almost more helpful might be like, how do I get the buy-in? Like, yeah, how, what's sure. the best way? And this will be different for each child, obviously. Every child yeah. has a different temperament and a different school situation and totally. athletic situation. But maybe, I mean, I, so maybe that's the direction I want to go in now is like when you're working with your clients, like how how do you get the buy-in? How do you kind of get the kids to actually do the thing and develop those skills? Yeah. Today's show is brought to you by my virtual private practice, Eat for Endurance. Did you know that I have a bunch of free nutrition resources on my website, including a download called Nutrition Tips for Student Athletes? I recently revised my website to make it super easy to find everything. Head on over to Nutrition Resources and you'll see free and low-cost downloads in the drop-down menu. I also have detailed blog posts on a variety of different nutrition topics, many of which are geared towards endurance athletes. If you're interested in my coaching services, I have been working with teenage and adult athletes of all abilities for over 10 years now, helping them feel and perform their best in their everyday and athletic lives. I currently have a few one-to-one -one openings and would love to work with you. You can fill out a new client inquiry form and schedule a free 10-minute call on my website if you're interested. I also offer small group coaching if you're interested in a lower cost option. I will open that up in January. You can fill out a form now though if you're interested and I'll get you on the list. All right, let's get back to our show. Yeah, I would I would first reach out to the parents and say, put it in this situation. If your spouse or partner wants you to do something and you don't want to do it, think about that because that's what's happening when yeah. you want your child <laughs> to do something and they don't want to do it, right? But here's the thing, as adults, we know we don't want to do it for a specific reason. Like, oh no, you know what? I'm, not, I'm just not ready for that or whatever. Like young athletes have no idea. They're just like, they hear it from their parent and the wall, the parental wall comes up like, oh, mom and dad is again. So 
this is how I get around that a lot of times. And we're really fortunate these days versus even 10, 15 years ago in sport nutrition, because we have so many colleges and universities that employ sport dietitians, yes. which we use to our benefit in private practice because we can say, hey, did you know, and I don't know the stats, but it's such a large proportion of D1 schools these days that have at least one full-time sport dietitian. So you could say, listen, if your goal is to play sports in college, you will actually have a full team, not only your sport team, but also sport dietitian, sport psychologist, medical, athletic trainer. And what we're trying to do now is give you that opportunity to get used to this team of professionals who are trying to help you succeed in the classroom and out of the classroom in your sport. So I position that a lot because then they're like, oh, you mean, oh, so that's normal. Because sometimes sometimes they think, oh, my mom and dad want me to work with a sport dietitian. There must be something wrong, right? And, and it's mm. not. Like we just literally want to teach good behaviors so they can create those for the rest of their lives. But I feel like if you break down the wall saying, hey, guess what? In college and even in pro sports these days, teams are, are hiring sport dietitians. So it's like a commonality. That's the first thing I use to break down that wall a little bit to try to get the athlete buy-in. Yeah. 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 And what about, what about kids who, cause I've worked with, you know, I'd say the bulk of my practice is recreational, mm -hmm. you know, adult athletes, but I get a lot of teenagers and the teenagers, you know, they're fairly competitive, but they may not be necessary. I mean, some of them are trying to you know play in in college but sometimes it's just this is just part of what they do they love right. being active and and it's kind of like you know the kid version of a recreational adult athlete right so yeah yeah you think about those things or maybe someone's just working out and all that um you know so it's it's i mean i think a lot of the time people are like by the time someone comes to me for the most part they're willing to change because they don't like how they're feeling right now. Right, and even right. in, in teenagers, they feel that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they feel the difference when they start to make those changes. Um, maybe, you know, maybe let's switch gears for a minute, thinking about how can parents be supportive of, you know, healthy fueling for everyday life and for athletics while still allowing their kids to just be kids. I think that's yeah, a really big one. So important. Yeah, it's you know what do you think the first thing one? the first thing I would say is is you have to drop the labels of food, right? So not using good and bad. Um it's kind of like the black and white, right? Don't use good and bad, don't use healthy and unhealthy because that creates a kind of a, a realm of food that we actually try not to go down. Like we don't want to go down that road much. So, oh, that cookie is is bad. But why is it bad? I mean, it's it's could actually be helping us create a healthy relationship with food. So is it bad, right? Air quotes. So I that's the first thing I tell parents is stop the labeling. Um, they just have to watch their vocabulary because listen, parents these days, like we all grew up at the same time. Like that, that's those are the words that were used, it's, right? I mean, yeah, it, and they kind of still are, but it's hard. What I'm saying is it's hard to break that vocabulary for parents, and I get that. But we have to think of food as how does that affect my young child's brain development and physical development, right? So if we're thinking about, you know, I always tell athletes, like if just since I brought up a cookie, uh, if you're going to eat a cookie, you know, time and a place, right? Don't eat the cookie mm -hmm. right before practice. That's probably not going to go well. Like who knows, right? You might throw it up or whatever. So I think just offering to the parents, like the freedom of exploring different types of foods, um, in, but in context of there may be a good time and a place for certain foods, but we want to get away from labeling foods. I would also just, just kind of share another golden nugget for the parents. Remember that young athletes have not developed their full taste preferences yet. In fact, I've, I've read research where we don't develop our full taste preferences until we're in our thirties, right? So they're going to go through a lot of likes and dislikes, sometimes daily, Some you never know, right? So I would just say, expect that it's nothing you're doing. Um, it's because literally they are finding their taste palette. So unfortunately, as parents, we kind of have to bob and weave a little bit and be like, oh, OK, so my my child doesn't like broccoli today. OK, what, what else can I do? What else can I offer them? But maybe in a year they love broccoli again. Right. So we just have to be ready for that and, and just accept that and maybe even tell the child, you know, you are going to change like your taste preferences, your likes, your dislikes but please don't use good and bad. Please don't use health, healthy and unhealthy because it, it starts to create that concept in a young athlete's brain 
the I can or I can't with food. And that's exactly what we don't want to promote. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, my kids are five, just one just turned five and another one's almost eight. And the five-year-old eats very few foods. The yep. eight year, almost eight-year-old eats some more things, but you know, she definitely loves her sweets and all that. And I just, as a dietitian, you know, I, I know the things to say and do, and I'm trying my best, but yep. you know, it, it can be hard sometimes when, you know, she's at school in an after school program where they just get all kinds of stuff and, or oh, we're just yeah. like back to back parties and like literally they've eaten nothing but pretty much sugary things all day yeah, long. And, yeah. um, and I'm really trying hard not to, you know, I'm not food shaming. I'm not trying to speak negatively about the foods and all that. And, and I think the thing that I try to get myself, and I'm not perfect with this language, but I really try my best. But um, the thing I get myself or try to, the angle I try to take is, especially with my older one, is like, how does this food make you feel? Mm -hmm. Because she's like, come home from a party where they had like a pinata full of candy and cupcakes and an ice cream sundae thing. And she just enjoyed all the things and she felt really sick. And so yeah. the next time she went to a similar party, she's like, you know, this time I don't think I'm going to have ice cream sundae because last time I just felt really sick. And I'm like, yeah, go for it. I mean, you listen to your body and what feels good. And so I think with all of these things, if we kind of bring it back to like, how does this food make you feel, which is the same thing I even speak to my adult clients about, you know, if you eat this, like, what do you notice? You know, how does that food make you feel? Um, and with, you know, the younger, younger clients, um, I think that can be something they can really think about and relate to. And it's a way to think about it in a way that isn't like, this is bad or good or healthy, unhealthy. It's just like, what is your own experience? Like, how did that feel to you in that moment? Um, and then the same thing with like, when we're talking about like fueling, you know, any kind of exercise or, you know, afterwards and how did that, you know, how did that, you know, training session go or whatever, you know, we can kind of simply think about those things. Like if they ate the cookie, which may or may not have gone well, like maybe right. it felt totally fine and maybe it felt like crap, you know? So like, I think that can be a nice way to kind of think about it. Um, and as you said, yeah, a time and a place for everything where, you know, it's not that these foods are bad and, and, you know, we want you to be able to enjoy food, pizza with your friends and all the things with, you know, whatever. And at the same time, you know, just focusing on like, Hey, we need certain foods so our body can grow well. And so you can, you know, do well in school and, you know, these kind of finding the things that are important to them. I always, I always, that's like my focus point with, my teenage clients, it's like, okay, what is important to you? Maybe you don't care about nutrition, but you really care about, you know, your cross country skiing or whatever it is, right. you know? Right. And so if you care about this, well, what can we do to make sure that that goes well? Well, here's yeah. how that, that goes well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's for me, I found a really good way to like get in and like get them to be on board with something. Um, because, you know, kind of along the lines of, you know, not knowing how to drive the car or whatever. Like sometimes they're kind of, they like the idea of something, but they don't actually want to do the things. To get yeah, there. exactly. Which exactly. I think is anyone really, right. They just want yeah. to like get to that point. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah. Well, and usually, I mean, nine times out of 10, this is what I relate to high school athletes is they're very interested in their energy level throughout the day. Right. Because when yeah. you ask them, hey, do you, how, what is your energy level like? Oh, it's, it, I'm kind of sluggish in the morning. Then I start to get some energy and then I'm a little sluggish after lunch. And then I like right before practice, I'm super tired. I'm like, yeah. So a lot of this has to do with your nutrition. Like there's, that's what you try to teach them yeah. is there's mm -hmm. like A plus B equals C here, right? So nutrition is part of this energy game or not having a lot of energy or fatigue. And that's like you were saying earlier, that's where the sleep and the caffeine comes in. But I feel like we can always relate and they can always relate to, oh yeah, I don't have good energy at in my first class or right before practice. Like, I think that's where we really target the education because then we can start talking about food. Like, oh, what did you have before you left your house for breakfast? Nothing. Oh, okay. So now let's, let's tie this into the whole story here. This is why you're not feeling energized. Right. So I think that's, it's so easy to come into the kind of the energy equation here. Yeah, for sure. And I think this is a good segue to sleep because, you know, I often see my teenagers skip breakfast and, mm -hmm. or just grab something really inadequate going to school. Um, and then they kind of get thrown into the whole school thing. And so they don't, yep. you know, maybe they're grabbing a muffin randomly or again, a bag of chips or whatever. Um, you know, and some schools have great food options. Some don't. Um, right. And, you know, suddenly like 
like I'm thinking about this one client who hadn't who'd barely eaten all day, super big guy. And he just ate like three bags of goldfish while he was studying because yeah. he was in the library and that's all that was around. And that was that. Right. And it's like, of course, you're not going to feel good. And yeah. so like when you talk about, OK, well, we need to get up early enough to eat something like eat a proper breakfast and then it's like oh but i don't want to get up earlier because of course they're up late studying right exactly. so they're already exactly. sleep deprived and so i guess you know the tricky part and this is always like where i this is where i talk about like the ideal and then real life right so we have kind of okay in an ideal world you'd be getting all of this sleep and you'd be wake up and having this meal and again this this applies to our adult population as well you know there's yeah. lots of sleep deprived adults yeah. but you know something has to give and so you know so and there's only so many hours in the day so especially with these kids who are often very over scheduled it's like okay well we try to figure out where, where can we get some time back? Is there anywhere that we can deprioritize so that you can go to bed a little bit earlier and wake up a little bit earlier? Or, or can maybe if you're not waking up early, can we have like a breakfast on the go or just something really like quick and easy that you could eat on your way to school or just something like we have to make some compromises. And so again, parents, this can be something you t can talk to your kids about, but it's hard because like, I mean, I remember what it's like being a super overscheduled child in in high school, trying to get into an Ivy League college and just super stressed out all the time and not sleeping. I mean, it doesn't feel like there are any minutes left to like they have to be towards studying or to whatever, whatever your extracurricular is. So I don't know if you have any tips with, you know, dealing with this particular challenge when it comes to sleep and finding more minutes in the day uh, to take care of yourself. Yeah, well. Yeah, you definitely, I mean, we all operate on the 24 hours a day, right? So yeah. I, I, this is, this is a pure example of being proactive versus reactive, right? So a typical high school athlete will wake up and they're very reactive to their morning, right? So alarm goes off. They don't have much time to get ready. They're out the door. Maybe they, like you said, grab a banana, a muffin, whatever. They're reacting to their day, right? <clears throat> the being proactive is literally like to your point and can we find some time in the day? It's not about the morning actually. Cause that's where I don't explore a lot with athletes. Cause I don't want to stress mm. them out more. Right. Mm. You can't ask them to go to bed early because they won't. Right. Yeah. You can't ask them to spend some more minutes in the morning getting ready or wake up early. Cause they're like, mm, yeah, that's not going to happen. So what do we do? Well, the proactive part of this is, well, you know, when you get home from practice um, and you eat dinner after dinner, what do you do? Oh, I usually study and you kind of decompress. Oh, perfect. That's a great opportunity to spend 10 minutes to prep your breakfast for tomorrow morning. So totally. make a smoothie, put it in the fridge, make some breakfast burritos, like prep an oatmeal, like just all dry ingredients. And then you just pour the milk in or water. So you can actually literally take five to 10 minutes prepping a breakfast for the pre for the next day. But again, they don't know that. Like we haven't, we haven't taught them that or their parents aren't thinking of that because their parents are thinking, oh, morning equals breakfast, right? Well, mm -hmm. breakfast actually equals night before these days for our, for our high school students because of their time restrictions. So that's the first place I go with them. Totally. I love that so much. And, yeah. and this is also where, you know, if parents are able to help out and, you know, I yeah. think it's great to get your, your student in, or your, uh, your athlete involved, um, especially in the teenage years, they should be able to help. But if like, they're just super busy studying for an exam or just something else is going on, they're busy in practice. They're, you know, some of these practice sessions go really late, you know, oh, yeah. um, if you're able and willing to like, Hey, maybe I'll prep their breakfast or I'll prep some snacks or I'll make a batch of some really great muffins and have those ready yep. to go or whatever, you know, like, like then awesome. That's something you can do for your kid. That's super, super helpful. And if the best, I mean, I always think about, well, what's the alternative? Like if before they were running out of the house with zero and now they're running mm -hmm. out of the house with a smoothie, like that's a huge win, you know? So yeah. we have to take the win and not think about, oh, well, this is how we can make it better. Well, yes, that's how you can make it better, but this is better than it was. So, it is, um, it is. So we kind of think about the, in like incremental steps, like what can we accomplish? Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, it's all about advanced prep for sure. It's advanced prep and it's having like easy solutions to things. So, yeah. you know, if for whatever reason, the night before thing doesn't happen, having like, a cheat sheet of like, okay, these are things like, and just knowing in your head, like write mm -hmm. them down, but then know in your head, okay, cool. I can literally make a toast, like some toaster waffles and just put some peanut butter in there and grab it and eat it on the go. Or I can have yeah. 
a single yogurt that I'm kind of bringing with me with some fruit and granola and just, or whatever, I don't know, whatever it is, yeah. like make a PB and J, you know? Yeah. So um, just having like really basic options that are available. And this is again, where parents come in, like it's knowing what things your kid will eat and having those things available to your yeah. kid. And that's happening for, you know, for many people, but not always. Yeah. And I would also say parents, because I've run into parents on both ends of this continuum, right? Some parents are like, they want to do everything for their kids. Great. Mm -hmm. Love you to death for doing that. They love you. But at a certain point, you actually want to not just, you know, provide, you also want to teach. And then yes. on the other side of the continuum, their parents were like, I'm not doing that. They're, they're high school. They should be able to know how to do this now. But they don't. They don't have the skills, right? Yeah. That's what I'm. Ta yeah. That's what I'm saying. Parents, like mm -hmm. your kids, don't have the skills yet to do it. So there is a little teaching that parents have to do. I mean, that's what we do as parents. We teach our kids. We right yeah. keep them safe. We need to teach them a little bit. So, like to your point, maybe the parent helped out a little bit. They made some muffins or whatever. I mean, here's what I would do: is maybe in the car or whatever. If you see them in the morning and they eat that muffin, say, "Oh, hey, how was that? Like, do, did you like it? What did you like about it?" Right. And then you can start processing what your kids are liking these days. And then you can use that maybe next day or next week and say, hey, you know, there's some time on the weekend. Let's bake these muffins that you like so much together. And now totally. they're part of the process. So eventually they're learning the skills on how to do it on their own instead of just being thrown in the pool without knowing yes. how to swim. Right. I mean, yes. That yes. unfortunately I see a lot with college athletes is like their parents haven't taught them. So now they're in college. They're like, I have no idea. Like, I don't even know how to boil water. Like, seriously, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, yeah. I see that all the time as well. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm even doing that with my kids because I, I, again, my five-year-old barely eats anything. But one thing she'll eat are, is like uh, the Kodiak mix. You know, I make oh, muffins yeah. out of yeah. it. And so I put some carrots or zucchini and I'm not hiding it. She knows it's there. It's the only way yep. she'll eat a single vegetable. And, you know, I'll put stuff in and, you know, I go over what ingredients are in there because she will never touch an egg. She won't touch yeah. a vegetable. <laughs> she won't eat a banana. But if I put all the things in a muffin, she'll yeah. eat it. So, right, you know, and right. so she's kind of sitting there stirring it with me. And obviously she can't make the muffins herself now, but it's right. you know, just part of the process. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I do love that a lot. Um, let's talk about maybe a little bit more about peer pressure, social pressures. Mm -hmm. um, I think that can kind of play into body image and just, again, this is a period of a lot of change mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you you mentioned before, like kids are just dealing with their bodies changing a lot when it comes totally. to performance. You know, we see this a lot in sport with, um, for instance, especially girls like going through puberty and, you know, gaining weight and just dealing with being slower or just this, mm -hmm. these changes that are happening. And yeah. Um, how are you kind of working through this with, with clients when you're, you know, it's, who are struggling? it's probably one of the most difficult things we do as sport dietitians. I'll just say that. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll say is that it is definitely not gender specific. Like we always used to talk about this in the female uh, yeah. you know, lens. It, it happens so often in males. It just, we don't, we don't hear about it that often. Um, for some reason, you know, guys just don't talk a lot about their feelings and stuff. <laughs> Shocking. Right. But anyway, yeah. it's, it's happening is what I'm saying, both in males and females. And like, you'll see, like, like in football, you'll see this all the time with, with boys football is like, you know, the freshman sophomore boys who have not hit puberty yet. And some freshman sophomore boys are post puberty. Right. And now all of yeah. a sudden, these guys that have not hit puberty, they're not able to stay on the team because literally not because they're not athletic, but literally yeah. because they have they have their biology working against them right now because they have not hit puberty yet. So, yeah, it's it's a real thing. Um, I mean, there are so many things to share with this. The, the biggest thing that we can share is obviously body images is a challenge for any particular person. It doesn't matter the sport, the gender, the position, no matter what. And it continues. It's not just a, oh, it's pre-puberty, puberty, right? It actually continues the rest of our lives, right? Oh, it yeah. really does, right? But that that time is very crucial and it's very sensitive because like you're saying, there's a lot of peer pressure. Like I feel as adults, we kind of understand the peer pressure a little bit more. And sometimes we get into it. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we forget about it. But young athletes, again, they don't have those critical thinking skills. So they don't know. They don't know what they don't know, right? So when they're in the peer pressure and they even, if it's just like looking a similar way or performing a certain way, like your coach saying, hey, you know, you used to be able to do this and now you're not, like what's going on? Like 
you know, unfortunately, just down that path, unfortunately, some coaches, uh, God love them to death, but sometimes they just are not using the right vocabulary or they're a little bit more old school, if you will. And yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't help that process. Right. But yeah. from the lens of the young athlete, I mean, the best thing to do is obviously not compare, but me saying that is not going to help anything because that's all yeah. they do. I mean, look yeah. at social media. Yeah. All they're doing is being entertained and yeah. comparing themselves. That was right? going to be my next thing is like, we need to talk about social media and like, oh my gosh. Just, like, uh, just in terms of nutrition, misinformation, body image stuff, just, ugh, it's just yeah. such a crazy space for everyone, but especially for our young people, it's a scary place. <laughs> well, because again, they don't have the critical thinking skills to say, yeah. oh, this is actually not real. Or maybe that's one in a million that actually has that response to whatever it is, right? And um, even I adults mean, have trouble. Like when yeah. it comes to nutrition misinformation, like uh, like I'm seeing this everywhere right now because of that whole like was that Congress thing with Vanny here, like the food babe, and yep. you know yep. all those ugh, just BS things that was going exactly. on. Exactly. I mean, it's just like crazy. But um, I mean, I I feel like young, you know, you know, teenagers in particular are so vulnerable to a lot of this messaging, and it's yeah. it's it's scary. It's hard to kind of deal with that because yeah, they haven't really learned necessarily, or maybe some of them haven't learned, you know, about what a, you know, a healthier diet is and, and some yeah. good kind of patterns of taking care of yourself and what to look out for in, in social media and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, and it's because they've grown up with only having social media. Like this is a generation that yeah. has never not had it. So that is their norm. Yeah. So that is like, you know, the encyclopedias uh, from 40, 50 years ago. Like that's, that's where you go for information. Right. Um, so, so I get it. And that's, that's the place they go. For, that's literally for their information. I like yeah. to share with them that, Hey, social media is entertainment. It's not information and education based. Oh, but yeah. I learned this and this. And like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to disregard that. There are every so often you're like, Oh, you know what? that's a good recipe or whatever it is. Right. But when it comes to quote unquote diets or ways of eating, that's where all of this misinformation is starting to come from. Because again, young athletes just, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know how to process. They don't have the filters yet. So I, you know, I, I always say, you know, when young athletes say, Oh, I heard this, 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 I'm like, so were you on TikTok or was it Instagram? <laughs> And they're like, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to qualify that first, right. These days. And like, okay, so like I still do this with, with my kiddos and they're older now. I'm like, okay, so what did you learn? And let's like, once they're older, you can actually talk through the process. Like, oh, you saw this drink and it's able to melt fat. Oh, well, let's talk about that a little bit. But when they're younger, like high school days, they don't want, they don't want to talk. They don't want to do it. They just want like, yeah. wow, this is real. Like it's on TikTok or whatever. This is real. And this is the truth. Right. And it's not most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, how do you like how, if, you know, messaging to parents, like how do yeah. you recommend that they kind of help their kids kind of navigate social media when it comes to nutrition, health, you know, body, all that yeah. stuff, because it's, it's a really murky, hard place. To, it, it to totally find. I mean, is, yeah. and, and a lot of people, um, you know, it's, it's where people socialize and it's, I mean, it's just, you know, yeah. it's something that it's like not realistic to be like, obviously don't go there. Like people are going to go there, but um, yeah, at least like teaching them how to be a little bit, you know, a little bit more discerning, a little bit, you know, have a little bit of disbelief about not believing everything they see and read and right. whatever. Um, well, and, and I think yeah. that's important is, is teaching that skill. Like when do you, when, when can you develop that filter, that knowledge to know when it's not right. Right. But you know, this is what I share to parents all the time is teach your kids about entertaining versus educating. Right. So they're, they're, you know, most social media is very entertaining, but there is a little bit of educating. Right. And, and I feel like in the nutrition realm, I use educating in reference to recipes, right? Because that. Yes, it, you are absolutely educating yourself when you're looking at recipes or whatever is going on on TikTok, like the newest trend on whatever muffin or whatever, just because you mentioned that earlier. But yeah, when yeah. it comes to, you know, entertaining is all about, oh, well, that person's wearing this and, oh, look at their hair. Look at, look at, look at how they look and they're a swimmer, right? That's entertaining. That does nothing to do with your self-confidence, your self-image. 
even though those messages are being planted in their brain, I think if we just kind of acknowledge that there is an entertaining and an education line, it's hard for them to learn. It's hard for us to teach sometimes, but if they hear it over and over, then maybe we can get closer into the reason why they're actually using social media and what they're what's happening from that in terms of the positive or negative consequences of it. Yeah, and I would add, you know, for parents just to kind of teach their kids, and this goes for parents too. Again, this isn't just kids when it comes to online stuff. Um, you know, knowing like who do we actually trust is mm, sometimes yes. a hard thing, and that's a bigger theme in this world right now with totally, news and all. Totally. I mean, you know, so it's like who do we trust? It's like I feel like that's a huge, huge thing. But specifically, like, hey, you know, don't get your nutrition advice from some random influencer who has no credentials. Like, maybe teaching your kids about okay, so these are the types of people, you know, dietitians, um, you know other there are other types of professionals that we can look like does the person have a phd you know nutrition nutrition science or are you know i mean as we know not all mds are trustworthy sources of nutrition so i'm hesitant to say that but still like right. looking for credentialed people um you know if like someone's like a chiropractor and they're giving nutrition information like or if they're a model or if they're whatever you know like like we just need to be careful about that so that can be something you know, just mentioning to your kids about, you know, just, hey, like, let's just, whatever the information is, maybe there's, you know, maybe it's some other type of information that's not nutrition related, and there's a different type of credentialed person that we can get it from. So just kind of being like, okay, cool, like, there's certain things we look for when consuming this type of content, right? So there's that. Yeah. Um, and there's also understanding that, you know, these can be complicated issues, and not everything is black and white. You know, so whatever is swirling around in the nutrition universe at the moment, just understanding that science is science and it changes and um, we don't always have like really clear cut and dry answers to things. Um, and and maybe that's a little bit too sophisticated for a teenager probably is actually. But at least I think emphasizing the kind of credentialed piece is I think it's an important thing to, to I think discern, so too. And, you know? and, you know, because they're faced with so many, in, we all are faced with so many influencers. I mean, yeah. I don't even know how you define influencer, but in my mind, like an influencer is a marketer, right? They are trying to make money off of marketing. So, okay. Like that is their role. Their role is not as a nutrition professional trying to, to provide valid information, right? So you, we always have to think of what's the role, what's the, what's the scene behind this person? Like if we're going to go on TikTok and do nutrition stuff, what would our role be? It would be as dietitians, right? Providing well, information. So yeah. Yeah. I kind of like, I agree. And I disagree with that because I think technically speaking, we are both like micro influencers. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Because yeah. you know what I mean? Like, but, but I, I, I do hear what you're saying because there are people out there who like literally have zero credentials and are out there selling, selling supplements or books on right. whatever. And you know, right. like that's different. Um, obviously we both seek to educate and connect with people and we also sell things because we have to make a living and, but right. you know, whether it's selling our services, which again, are, you know, after all the education and experience we have or your books or, you know, whatever, like, obviously yeah. like we're not, uh, you know, we're, we also have things to sell. So I don't want to pretend like I'm not oh, trying yeah, to just yeah, ever yeah, not yeah. sell things or market. I'm really crappy right. at marketing, but I do do that. Um, but no, I get, I do get your point there. So I think, I think that's one thing. Um, I totally had another thing I want to think, but I totally forgot. So that's okay. I'll, yeah. I'll come back to it. Um, yeah. Oh, I know. I know what I was going to say. I think the other piece to it is like the whole role modeling part. So you know, like we have all the social media stuff and they're essentially looking to all these people, whether it's celebrities that they look up to or admire, or maybe they're pro athletes, you know? So there's like, you know, a lot of people are looking up to these pro athletes and just understanding just the basic thing of like, Hey, what works for that person may not work for you. They are a different person. You are a unique person in your own unique body. And that can be a, a very, like, we can simplify that message. And that can be another message that a parent gives to you know, their kid, like, of like, like, Hey, it's totally cool to like, look at what these people are doing, but it doesn't mean it's going to work for you, you know? And, exactly. and just kind of, again, you can be information gathering and experiment. Um, but recognizing that you're just a unique person. And then yeah. with parents, I think, and I certainly feel this, you know, of just like, 
or at various points in my life, like you need to like deal with your own, they all, I know in many ways they call it like reparenting yourself and, and kind of dealing, basically dealing with your own crap and dealing with your own baggage and not like projecting upon your kids and being really careful about whether it's the language you use or how you're talking to yourself about your own body. And, you know, if you're kind of dieting and all that, like thinking about the impact it has on your kid. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of clients who have definitely like experienced various levels of trauma from all kinds of stuff that happened in their household when they were kids, you know, because of their mom that was dieting or their you know, dad that was doing this and that. And, and we're dealing with the aftermath as adults because they just never mm-hmm. really developed a healthy body image. They never really learned how to eat. They went through various forms of disordered eating and stuff. So just remembering that, you know, your kids really do see and hear everything you say. Um, and I ages. say this as a parent, it's at all ages. I say this as a parent, it's really hard. It's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> so just remembering that. Yeah, it is because you are fighting the things in your head, right? And how you grew yes. up in the same time you're trying to teach your kids maybe away from that a little bit, right? It's, it, it is, it's not like parents, I just tell people, I mean, parents, no one ever teaches us how to parent, right? I mean, we can yeah. go to school to learn whatever trade we want or about whatever you can go online, but no one teaches us how to parent because I don't think there is such thing, right? Because there's so many different roads you could take to how to, I don't even know if you could say successful parenting in the same sentence. Like, yeah, because yeah. all of us have different definitions like? of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. But no, it's a good point. I think we have to look in the mirror first as a parent before we start teaching our young athletes or young children. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of the things I work on with my adults, whether it's like working through various food beliefs and fears and rules and things like that, and it can be really hard if you're really harboring a lot of stuff and your own Mm -hmm. feelings around nutrition, it's really hard to keep that separate from your kids. Like you might try, but all it means is it's really important if you're struggling yourself with stuff to explore that, whether it's with a therapist and or a dietitian or whatever you're doing for yourself, because if, if you don't want to pass it along to your kids, like you really have to deal with some of that stuff. And, yeah. and that goes, I mean, I certainly experienced this kind of stuff, even with other forms of parenting, whether it's like dealing with behavioral problems with my children. And like, I grew up in a household where like, there was definitely a lot of yelling, you know, mm-hmm. and I find myself like, I really have to work hard not to yell at my kids. Cause like, mm-hmm. that's how I was treated when someone yes. was behaving, quote unquote, yes. you know, behaving. Right. So, you know, like that's kind of another version of like, Ooh, I really need to like work on myself and like what's going on for me. So I can then better like deal with these issues that are coming up with my kids. And the same, I think the same thing with nutrition applies. Oh, it does for sure. And it's just, you know, we know more now about or as adults, but we've had to go through some pretty bumpy roads, right? And that's yes. that's what we're trying to, I mean, young athletes do have to find their bumpy roads, but we're trying to limit their bumpy roads. I think that's what we always do from generation to generation, right? You're always trying yeah. to be better than the generation ahead of you. Um, but we all, we all have the bumpy roads, all the curveballs that are thrown at us. And like, we have to experience those. The goal is not to, not to completely irregardlessly, you know, just get those out of our lives because we have to have those That's kind of what shapes us right as adults. And we have to learn from our failures in, at, at sometimes at a young age, but yeah, I totally agree with you in terms of kind of doing some work on our own self first. Yeah. Any last words as we wrap up this topic? I, we've kind of gone all over the place. We so. have. Yeah. Um, but I, mean, I like that. This is, this is a little bit more of a flowing conversational you know, yeah. episode, which I like. I would, I would just say this, like, you know, with, with parents or two parents, um, and even maybe, maybe that young athlete listening, if you can look at nutrition in terms of energy level and your thought processes, like, oh, am I able to concentrate in class? Am I able to pay attention to my coach? And do I have steady energy throughout the day? Those are the things you really want to focus in on when it comes to nutrition. I, I don't want to say first or last, but those are really important, um, you know, initial steps to, to, instead of shaming food and saying, oh, this is good, this is bad, or, you know, so-and-so does this, so-and-so does that, think about your own self first. So I would just leave it with that. I love that. 
Well, thanks yeah. so much, Bob. Where can Thank everyone you. find you? And I know you want to shout out your new book. So give us all I, the info. I do. I've got a new edition of my metabolic efficiency training book, of which is all about how to optimize blood sugar with uh, you know choosing foods and how to choose them. Uh, I, it, it is very relative to young athletes. I actually have a little bit of a, a small section in there on young athletes. So you can easily find that. It's actually on Amazon now. Uh, you can also go to my website, energyperformance.com. That's E-N-R-G performance.com. Or just Google me because I'm just about everywhere. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. This was so much You're fun welcome. to chat about. And uh, I hope you get another chance to explore the 200 experience and, and hopefully this time with a buddy, as you said. <laughs> yes, it'll be there. It'll be there for sure. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a good one. Thank you. All right. That's our show for today. I hope you all enjoyed that one. And if you did, please make sure you hit follow or subscribe wherever you listen. And if you have a minute, I would be so grateful if you could also review and rate my show wherever it is that you're listening to me. If you're able to support the show financially, I do have a Patreon page. I'd love to see you over there. You can donate a dollar or a few dollars or whatever you feel comfortable doing. Patreon members get some really great perks, including merchandise, huge discounts on my digital downloads, and so much more. Thank you so, so much for your support. Please feel free to email me, claire at eatburners.com with any feedback, questions, or topic requests. And if you haven't already joined my monthly newsletter, you are missing out. I send lots Lots of goodies over there and lots of great nutrition tips. Um, you can join that by visiting my website. You also get a little freebie there just for, for joining my newsletter. All right. Thank you so much. I will see you all next time.